understand who the fuck I am on this U.S. land. I let my hair grow, then I cut it off. Put a couple lines in it, cause you know I'm never coming soft. I do a lot of shows and I get a lot of stares. I got a lot of haters, but really who cares? Well, according to Conan, I'm too much. And welcome to Mitch Please, guys. Thank you very much for giving us a click. It's been a minute. Uh, yeah, you know, I just, there's been a lot of things going on in life. Uh, and I just feel like this show, as much as I love it, I don't have as much love for it as I did when I began. And I'm going to find that love. And I'm going to find that love in a lot more things. But as far as this show goes, guys, we're going to be knocking it down to once a month. I think that's going to just be better overall. You know, uh, it's tough to listen to uh, any show or watch any show uh, once a week and, and stay up on it. You know, and that's just in general. Uh, this is an on-demand YouTube uh, show, so you can watch it whenever you want. Listen obviously mainly whenever you want and uh i just want to really focus on my my time on other things and those things i'm going to get into here uh for you guys basically what's going on is i'm getting surgery on my shoulder i'll be getting that surgery uh in a few weeks so it's nerve-wracking i've been i've talked about it a few times here on this uh on this show here right in front of this microphone you know i've been anticipating it for almost a year uh since the injury occurred back in november of 2015 and you know uh, basically the doctors would look at my shoulder and they'd be like oh you know it's just separated it'll be fine oh you know and then finally i got a doctor that's you know really said hey let's look at these x-rays again because there's a crack bone in my shoulder so basically what I'm looking at as far as my surgery goes is they're going to remove the bone spur. Now, the doctor told me that's what he's going to do tentatively. But I mean, when he opens me up, anything could happen. So you know, it's, I'm nervous, guys. I'm not going to lie. I've never been put out, knocked out, uh, you know, never been operated on, opened up. Uh, so it's, you know, very uh, nerve wracking. So uh, currently I've been... Also, packing up my stuff, getting ready to pack up all my stuff and move out of Chico um, for the surgery, be closer to my doctor. Uh, so that's going to go down um, in paradise. So I won't be too far, but still, you know, being back in paradise, you know, basically on and off in paradise my whole life. It just, I always get drawn back there. And now I'm getting drawn back there for a surgery, um, you know, on my shoulder. But. The thing is, too, I, I think it's going to help in the long run. You know, we're going to be, we're going to get back to oh, the old Mitch. I need to get back to the old Mitch, guys. I've, uh, this last nine, nine months to a year of, of, you know, um, separating myself from, from wrestling, from pro championship wrestling in particular, PCW, uh, which has been such a huge part of my life for so long. It's been kind of a, a tough thing and i've packed on some weight you know of course dealing with this injury uh not finding the best outlet i am so appreciative for this outlet because this is an outlet um that has helped me but at the same time i'm looking in the mirror and i'm not happy with the person that i'm seeing and you know this needs to be said and it's my fault so it's time to turn things around here uh, as I record this, it's Sunday. On Tuesday, I'll be out. I'll be basically in a new routine, a new life, and I'll be doing things a lot um, better for myself. I'm going to be living a healthier lifestyle than I've been living. Kind of cut out all the beer, cut out all the bad food, get back to the gym, getting there twice a day, and just getting serious, doing my cardio. I, I have been slacking on my cardio for this whole time you know so um it's time to get serious and like i said get back to being the old mitch because uh it, it's just what i want to be i want to be a me a happy me you know to uh 
anyways we're getting deep here on the show that's just how i do it um but i just want to let you guys know what's going on as far as you know the surgery is going to happen uh the show's only going to be going uh this is going to be my september show i won't be releasing another episode until october but you know this is a great show here today guys i've actually you know got one of my probably my favorite interviews that i've ever done uh so far here on episode 14 of Mitch Please, uh, we're going to have Jody Christofferson uh, coming through the show here here in just a few minutes. I, I want to talk about some stuff because I said I was going to talk about it, and then uh, you know life happened, and like I said, it's been a few weeks. But it was kind of a cool thing that happened, you know. Uh, uh, Conan um, has a podcast called Keep It 100, and it's. Uh, produced through the Chris Jericho Network on Podcast One. He's got Disco Inferno and Kevin Gill uh, as his kind of his co-hosts. And basically what happened was uh, Brian Cage had went on their show. This was about a month ago, probably now, maybe. And uh, basically, you know, Sonny's name was brought up as a girl that he really thought was hot. And then in transitioning over to my name and calling me basically the biggest scumbag Excuse me, let me let me quote him directly here. Uh, he, he referred to me as the biggest fucking scumbag of all time. And at first I was I was offended, you know, I was like, wow, I was like, man, me and Brian have been through a lot. I've known him for over a decade and you know, we've been through a lot together. But um I don't know if it was just he was trying to be funny. Um regardless. I'm actually very appreciative of it, and about 10 minutes after, you know, digesting it, I was like, oh, this is great, you know, this puts me over as a heel, <laughs> you know, and uh, it, you know, my name was just mentioned on this, uh, on this show that, that gets thousands and thousands of listeners, so I even responded to it on Twitter, and then Conan messaged me on Twitter, DM'd me, uh, slid through my DM box, and said, hey man, what's going on? And I said, well, hey, uh, I just would like a chance to explain myself. Maybe, you know, here's who I am. And I sent him a few videos. I sent him a match I had. Uh, I was a couple years back. Um, but the production uh, value of the video of the match is kind of what I really liked. Um, so I probably should have sent him a more recent match because he, he ripped into it. I'll get to that later. <laughs> but I uh, uh, sent him the True TV stuff, um, which me and him and Disco actually we talked about um, off air. I guess it wasn't edit, wasn't aired anyways. I'll get to this guy. Sorry, I'm confusing you, I'm sure. Um, I sent him the True TV video. I sent him the, uh, like a promo, I think, when I first won the belt. And we were in talks, and he said, okay, you know, he didn't get, really get back to me. But I was like, that's, you know, that's fine. Um, I, I just kind of said, whatever. Then I Kevin Gill messages me and says, hey, man, we want to interview you tomorrow. And I was like, whoa crazy at first i was like yeah, this is a work you know it's a rib so but i was like cool man yeah yeah three o'clock i'm ready to roll let's do it and uh you know three and then by four o'clock the call comes and i'm just like wow this is awesome i got conan calling me with disco and you know kg a guy that i've always uh been uh friendly with and kind of really kind of liked and admired over the years and then, of course, Disco Inferno and Conan. It's like, these guys are legends. You know, Conan especially. He's like the Hulk Hogan of Mexico. So it's like, it's a big deal. Um, and I know that they just kind of wanted to just kind of maybe poke fun at me a little bit, even, you know, or whatever. But it was not really, to me, seen as a call that, you know, an interview that was, it was a, it was a serious thing. You know, they wanted my opinions on things, and I gave it to them. And, you know, about 10 minutes of you know my interview air and i did about 15 they cut out the true tv stuff we talked about that and then they cut off a little bit of my ex uh, explanation of the wrestlemania weekend um and they also cut off where i said thank you to brian cage at the end you know right at the end i go hey mitch valentine on facebook and brian cage came on here last week and said that i was the scumbag and i just want to tell brian cage thank you so and i do want to tell brian cage thank you so i'm saying it now and we're almost 10 minutes in guys i can't believe i can blabble like this babble and blabble uh by myself but i can so i'm doing it and uh it was a great thing guys check that out keeping it 100 with conan 
uh, my interview. It was episode eight, also featured on the show. This is crazy, right? Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, X Pac, uh, like Juventu Guerrero, uh, Vince Russo, and Mitch Valentine. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That was it was really fun. I was excited about it. You know, if you guys follow me on Facebook, you saw I was real uh I was I was real excited and, and happy to have that happen. It was a cool thing. You know, hey. Um I'm the undefeated PCW champion. I bapped a WWE Hall of Famer and I've been featured on the Chris Jericho Network. <laughs> oh, and on True TV. So those are my big claims to fame. And hey, you know what? I'm uh, I'm proud of them. But let's talk about some WWE guys. I uh, I did watch SummerSlam and and I watched NXT Takeover Brooklyn. Also that weekend was the UFC 202 with McGregor and Diaz. So I mean, it was a jam packed weekend, and I know I haven't had a chance to talk about that. And that was a it was a kind of a crazy weekend for me personally. But as far as the entertainment goes, you know, I thought NXT overall uh, stole the sh- you know stole the weekend. I, I thought that uh, just the presentation. I liked the video package at the start. And uh, you know Bobby Roode's entrance was glorious. It was it was great. Um, I'm just going off memory here, guys, because you know me. You know I don't have notes, so I'm just going here off memory. But the things that stand out, like I said, Bobby Roode's entrance. I mean, they made him look like a superstar. It reminded me of Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania when he wrestled the Undertaker, but in a different light. You know, it wasn't you know the the heaven you know ish vibe. It was more of just like look at this freaking guy. You know, he's glorious. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, and that was good stuff. I thought, um, you know, Oscar and Bailey was, was fun. You know, I thought that, going back, I thought the tag team, the NXT Tag Team Championship match was super, uh, and no offense to these guys, but, I mean, overrated because everyone's putting it over like it's the greatest thing they've ever seen. And it's just like, no, it's these four guys that are going out there and doing a bunch of kicks and super kicks and slapping the heck out of their thighs and doing a bunch of false finishes and I don't really understand any of their characters you know again no disrespect to these guys cuz it's not all on them you know it, it could be it's the way they're you know the way they're produced the way they're you know the creative whatever you know you, you can't blame the guys cuz they're doing their thing but it, it's also um a genre of wrestling that People, some people appreciate, and some people like me, I'm just not too into it. I want to see characters. I want to see stories told in the ring. And to me, uh, in that NXT Tag Team Championship match, there wasn't really a story told. And again, you, you ask somebody else that likes that kind of wrestling, and they probably could tell me the whole story. And and I'm just, I just wasn't into it. So, again, with all due respect to to all four of those guys, uh, Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano, uh, Dash and Dawson, man. Nothing but respect for all the hard work and the bumps and the bruises and everything you guys have done in your careers and will continue to do. It's just that match in particular I wasn't a fan of. Um, also, um, I'm trying to think back here. Like I said, the Oscar Bailey match I thought was fun. I, I, I really enjoyed that. They, I thought, you know, Oscar is just crazy. You want to talk about a character? She looks like she's a Japanese killer. Like, straight up. When she comes out there, I think she could kill a girl just like that. So, I mean, she's 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 got it going on. And then, of course, Bailey's just got this vibe where every, you, you just can't help but, but smile and like her. And uh, then she would go on to make her, you know, her WWE Raw debut the following Monday with a huge reaction. People love her. She's money. You know, and then the main event, Samojo Nakamura. Now, when Nakamura came out with that violin... The vibe where I was at, everyone froze and was just glued to the screen. That was incredible. I mean, just, it was a WrestleMania-type entrance, and it was so damn simple. But um, but I loved it. The match was good. You know, I was really kind of surprised to see Samoa Joe lose the belt. I thought they'd give him a little bit longer reign. You know, the guy uh, just won the belt like three, two, three months ago. So, uh, I was shocked at the finish. Um, I thought you could have had uh, Nakamura like just pass out from the pain, not even tap, not get pinned, just pass out from the pain of the choke. But you know, we'll see where they go with those two guys. I think you got to do a rematch and uh, and then maybe send Joe over to SmackDown or something. 
Um, and, and there's so much that has happened, guys. I'll talk about SummerSlam. I want to reflect on a few other things that have happened in particular. Uh, but SummerSlam, to me, was, was all right. John Cena versus AJ Styles uh, stole the show. I mean, without a doubt, I mean, you know, a lot of false finishes and stuff, but I mean, that should have been, they should have never wrestled at Money in the Bank. That should have been their first match, and to be honest, it should have been in the main event, or the set, or, or I mean, you, you got to put that on a bigger platform, but I mean, it stole the show, the crowd was dead, it was a six plus hour show, uh, too long, um, you know, of course, the stuff with Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton. I mean, this is old news, guys, but I'm just going to go. I'm going to go ahead and touch on it here because I feel like, you know, I'd like to voice my opinion on, on some of this stuff. You know, the Brock Lesnar uh, elbows raining down on Orton and blasting him open. I don't know what the deal with that was. I know that. Um, it, you know, so much has come out, you know, Chris Jericho confronting Brock after and, uh, you know, Randy wanted it and, and everything was was uh, was a work or whatever. Um, but I don't know. I really just think that uh, it, it, it probably got a little out of control. I, I don't know if, you know, Randy maybe I don't know if he just wanted a, a bloody lip or a bloody I and it just wasn't happening the blood wasn't coming out so Lesnar rained down on that elbow and that split him right away um but it's just weird that that it seems like only in Brock Lesnar matches do we get blood um so it's uh, it makes him special though the rest of the card just kind of didn't really stand out to me guys the title matches were the, were were all right you know, uh, it was great, cool to see Finn Balor go over, and, and then of course having to relinquish the belt. And I know that again, this is old news, uh, guys. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but I just want to touch on everything here before we get to our interview with Jody Christofferson about what's been going on in this wrestling world because the build-up for me, you know, with Finn Balor losing the belt, and then you know they do they do a uh, a little tournament, little fatal four-way final uh, to crown the new champion with Kevin Owens going over, and it, I just never would have thought that they were put the belt on Kevin Owens. I mean, I'm a huge Kevin Owens fan, and I thought, man, like that'd be great if they put it on him. But it seemed like the way they were they were kind of booking him, you know, as, as a tag team with Chris Jericho, kind of not really in the title picture at all. And then for him to win it out of nowhere with help from Triple H, that's interesting stuff. I want to watch Raw and see what the heck's going to happen next because that was a really awesome creative move by wwe i mean straight up props I, I posted it on facebook i said man that's the reason i still love wwe and uh and now switching over to the ufc world again going back mcgregor diaz man what a battle uh, i'm sitting there and sweating at the bottom of the uh, shenanigans bar and grill and just with a bunch of loud people screaming and going crazy and uh, it was a good fight, man. Jeez. Uh, you know, a part of me wanted John Cena to come out and just hit McGregor with the AA. But uh, I figured McGregor would go over. Um, I was almost thinking the whole thing was work and Diaz might just get knocked out for McGregor to go over to set up three. But they went all five rounds um, and it was pretty damn close. The way I looked at it was uh, Diaz was more aggressive. Uh, you know, octagon control. And it was almost like he landed more punches, but I think, uh, obviously, uh, you know, McGregor might have got more strikes and more takedowns and whatever and won by decision, but, uh, you know, good business by UFC. You know, they got to do it number three, and that'll be huge, and they'll probably charge way too much for it. So I'll end up, again, in a sweat box of a bar crammed between a bunch of yelling, screaming people. So I could watch it for five bucks. <laughs> but seriously, uh, yeah. And, and as I record this, guys, we're getting ready for CM Punk's first fight. It's uh, this Saturday, September 10th. As long as he stays healthy, I can't imagine them, him, him pulling out now. And uh, and that's what AJ Lee says. Boom, boom, boom. I need a drum roll. I need, like, some sound effects. I'm, uh, that's the thing, too, guys, with me doing this uh, This. This now uh, once a month. I'm gonna I'm gonna start kind of getting my thinking cap on here about doing some more stuff on this show, having some special um, 
some some more special guests, some more special effects. I digress. I'm going to go back here. Uh, CM Punk, it's going down. And I really am rooting for this guy. I've been watching his uh, Evolution of Punk documentary. It's been awesome. And I'm just curious to see what happens. And I'll be watching intently uh, to see what happens with CM Punk. Uh, real quick here, just want to touch on the Cruiserweight Classic. I think it's been, uh, it's been all right. Rich Swan is the guy that has stood out the most to me. So, uh, just again, his character, he, he's entertaining, and he is my pick, hopefully, to take it. We'll see what happens. Uh, Pro Championship Wrestling uh, has a lot of stuff going on. Uh, they have a show in September. It's uh, September 24th, I believe. Let me double check that. I, I know it's the final showdown between Boyce Legrand, who's challenging Sin for the title. Uh, it's going to be kind of the final confrontation uh, will be, uh, you know, of course, at Work Farm Wars, and that is September 24th. Okay, good. I was right. Um, so that's going to be a good show, guys. Check that out. It's like 10 bucks. It's at the PCW Work Farm. It's the final stop before Off the Chain, and Off the Chain uh, is going down at the Oroville Municipal Auditorium, of course, October 15th. So you want to check that out as well. Um, you got Will Roberts versus Primetime in the cage going down and off the chain. And Boyce LeGrand versus Sin for the championship. I don't know what else they're doing, but uh, you will, I'm sure, find out more if you attend Work Farm Wars uh, September 24th at the PCW Work Farm. Uh, support them, guys. Like them on Facebook and follow what they're doing. And, uh, you know... We'll, we'll we'll see what happens with uh, that cage match too. I mean, what's you know there hasn't been a cage match in PCW in three years. I remember the last one was actually me and Shoop Shellhammer against uh, you know Prime Time and Rick Luxury uh, for the tag team championships. Ironically, at Off the Chain because the Off the Chain concept. If I can just give you guys a little inside scoop here, I actually created the Off the Chain name. It was when we were running at Off the Wall Soccer, and I just wanted something that was kind of catchy. I was the first show at Off the Wall Soccer here in Chico, the Off the Wall Arena, and I was like, Off the Wall, Off the Chain, bam. And PCW had an event named Chain Reaction. So it kind of was inspired by that as well. So it's Chain Reaction, then it was Switch. I said, no, Off the Chain sounds, sounds modern, it sounds hip, it's cool. And then... I uh, had the idea, let's let's do the cage match, you know, at off the chain, you know, it just kind of fits. So um, PCW hasn't done, though, a cage match in three years. So this will be the first one in three years. It'll be primetime and Will Roberts. And, of course, the buildup for all of that September 24th. All right, speaking of Pro Championship Wrestling, my guest this week is a guy that I met through Pro Championship Wrestling almost 10 years ago. He's one of my favorite people I've ever met in any aspect of life. Um, let's cut right over to it right now. We're sitting here in the historic Oroville Municipal Auditorium. I'm with my guest this week on Mitch Please. He's a guy that I've known for almost a decade. Uh, he is big country. He is the war pig, Jody Christofferson. Jody, thank you so much for coming on the show, bro. Uh, anytime, Mitch. Thanks for having me, man. Dude, the first time I met you was right here at the Orville Municipal Auditorium. You had just started training with All Pro Wrestling in the APW Boot Camp. And uh, I'll never forget it. You were on security, as was I. And uh, I remember uh, Gabe Ramirez during the show was yelling at you to take off your security shirt and wipe the floor with it. And being as you were so young and, and really totally green, had no idea what was going on, you took that expensive PCW security shirt off that we had got sponsored and wiped the floor <laughs> with it, bro. <laughs> and that was the first night I met you. Well, uh, not only that, uh, Peyton, you know, AJ's valet at the time, stuck her boot in my face and told me to wipe her boots off. And, you know, like I didn't want to get fired, so of course I wipe her boots off, you know. And, you know, of course Roland comes up to me, you stupid, son, you know. <laughs> It is what it is, but good times, man. Oh, no doubt, man. And, and we would uh, continue to kind of train together. I remember going up to APW or going down to APW for a, for a pro camp and before a gym wars and training with you there, man. And we've got so many stories. I want to start out, though, the, the start of your life, bro. I mean, you grew up. I mean, everybody knows.
knows you're Chris Christopherson's son. I mean, how was life growing up? Well, you know, we were always taken care of, you know, obviously. Um, my dad busted his ass throughout his lifetime, and, you know, because of that, we were able to grow up in Hawaii, you know, and I grew up on the islands, and, you know, when I turned 18, I went to college at Moor Park, and after that, I said, look, if I graduate, I'm going to want to wrestle. If I don't graduate, I'm going to want to wrestle. School's not for me. Well, I might as well do this while I'm young, and... The rest is history, you know, and it's funny because in the first couple of years of my career, everybody said, you know, well, you can't be a cowboy and be from the islands, you know, <laughs> so where's your dad from? And I said, well, Brownsville, Texas. And they said, okay, let's go with that. And it wasn't until recently that I just said, you know what, screw that. That's not where I'm from, you know, and started repping where I'm really from. And... You know, it's it's been one hell of a ride, you know, at APW, starting with guys like you, you know, guys who are entertaining and overlooked. But, you know, it's like, it is what it is, you know. Like, we're all starving to get somewhere, but we wouldn't be here if we didn't love doing it. You know? Yeah, man. No, similar, uh, I started out the similar way, 18, you know, school wasn't for me. But, uh, Jody, when did you first notice professional wrestling? What drew you to professional wrestling made you fall in love with it? Well, I've been in love with it since... I was seven years old, you know, and my dad had a bunch of old Hulk Hogan tapes and we would watch those religiously. And I mean, I get a lot of crap for this, but the two guys who actually were inspirations for me to become a professional wrestler were Hulk Hogan and John Cena, nice. you know, and the two top dogs. A lot of people give them crap, but you know, they're good at what they do. Yeah. Because less is more, man. Less oh, man. is more. Two of the most successful guys in the history of professional wrestling, larger-than-life characters. You would establish yourself down the line as, a, I think, a larger-than-life character, and we'll get to that. But again, man, starting out, what kind of things did you do to prepare yourself for pro wrestling? Was you, were you heavily involved in sports? I mean, Well, yeah, I started amateur wrestling when I was seven in the hopes that someday that I would be a professional wrestler. Right. And it wasn't until later in my college days where I was working security that you know my dad was in dublin ireland and wwe was in dublin ireland and he said you know what we're not working tonight go catch a show and it was eminem you know joey mercury and johnny nitro versus booker t and hardcore holly and after seeing that match and seeing them there's no other way to say it seeing them work their magic in the ring i was like i gotta do this for a living and so my brother looked up schools for me because he was like yeah jody's serious about this my brother jesse christopherson he's always been one of my biggest supporters in wrestling and you know they looked up apw and, and this was like 2005 2006 this this was in 2006 but i didn't start my training actually it was in 2004 that i signed up for the camp oh, wow. but i didn't start training until 2007 right. technically and so there summer summer 2007 man i'll never forget it mm -hmm. um what were some of your initial experiences you were 18 years old at the time uh no actually i started a lot older than some people i was like 23 going into it because i've always wanted to do it but i just never knew how to get into it and it wasn't until i was 23 that i started looking up stuff and i'm like okay here we go you know and Took a long time to get the ball rolling, but it got it rolling, you know. And Roland Alexander was the one who said, all you need is APW and a dream. And the training there was really gnarly, you know. I mean, they had John Anderson, strong man, blowing snot rockets on us while we're doing bear, <laughs> while we're doing bear crawls, you know, around the ring. And I got to cut you off, Jody, because I was strong man John Anderson. I remember that. He started, uh, and you started. You guys were all kind of... Uh, Start. You guys both kind of start at the same time, from what I remember. And I remember one time, uh, me and Zach and Scotty Aboot, Zach Reeb and Scotty Aboot drove down to APW uh, Gym Wars, and we all were in the pro camp. John Anderson was in there, uh, and he was given he. He, Zach was working with him on, on learning that Farouk kind of spine buster for like a finish. And I remember uh, we had a crash pad down or whatever. And this is going inside, but this is, this is just how we do it on this show, man. He was slamming us down on those crash pads. And, and uh, this was probably your first month of training. And I think you took the bump or something on the crash pad. And I remember Roland was very upset about it. And rightfully so, you know, because you had just started. But, I mean... 
Um, that's the thing that strikes me about John Anderson. Big, strong, monster of a guy. And uh, w what were some of your other initial experiences uh, when you first started training with APW? Well, I want to touch on that a little bit, you know, because, like you said, it was my first month of training. I was excited, you know, and they said, you know, you want to take this move from John? And I said, sure. Right. But I hadn't trained to take this move. Right. And like you said, John Anderson is not a normal man. He's a house. And when that guy hits you, it's like he's hitting through you. And even when he's throwing you down onto a crash pad, it's like he's throwing you through the crash pad. And, yeah. you know, he's just, <laughs> the guy's an ox, you know. And I love him to death, but he's, a, he's an ox. And, you know, at first I was upset about that because I thought I was going to get kicked out, you know, for doing something I wasn't trained to do. But, you know, they said, no, that's that's just how shit goes, man. And that was actually may toughen me up a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the, a lot of people will tell you, now, war pig's not that smart, but his head's pretty t tough. So, yeah, man. hard head. <laughs> but, but, yeah, the, my experience is, you know, I was, I was originally supposed to be trained by Dana Lee, but Dana had all of his students, you know, raring to go, and he was focused on them. He didn't really have time for me. So the person who ended up training me was Joseph Rodriguez, a.k.a. Jekyll's the Jester. And when Roland said, wow, Dana, you did a really good job with Jody, he said, no, that wasn't me. That was Jekyll's. And that's what made Jekyll's started training people. And, you know, I owe my career to that guy. And I owe my career to Sparky Ballard, too, because all the other students in my camp, you, I mean, you were training with me, but you weren't APW. You were no. PCW. So all the other APW guys in my class dropped out. And so the only guy who could take moves from me was Sparky. And he's oh, a referee, not yeah. a wrestler. So I, I owe the world to that man. And, but if I could do it all over again, I would. Yeah, man. I mean, me and you, we, you, you know, I was up here in the Oroville, California area. You were down there in Hayward uh, training with APW. I was learning kind of just you know, on the road with Zach because we didn't have a school here at the time. So I was just kind of learning as I went, uh, which was a really tough way for me personally to come in. But I remember me and you, bro, we were setting up the PCW ring damn near by ourselves. We experienced a lot. I think that a lot of guys that were as green and young in the business probably didn't get a chance to experience as far as hanging out with guys like Zach Reeb and hanging out with guys like Venice DeMarco and going to their house and just learning from them outside of the ring, man. I thought it was real beneficial, I know, for me. How about for you? Well, that's the thing that kind of upsets me nowadays. I mean, don't get me wrong. People retire and people move on with their lives and stuff. But I wish people growing up in the business today had somebody like Venice DeMarco. I mean, you still got your Ricks and you got your MPTs and you got Timothy Thatcher, Jekylls, people you can learn from. But Venice was just such a veteran. You know, he was the guy you wanted to pick his brain. You know, he was the guy to go up to like, what do I do better? Could you please watch my match? You know, what can I do to get better as a wrestler? And just hearing the talk, the guy talk to is na a national pastime. I love it. <laughs> I mean, he's so entertaining, man. I, I personally was able to learn so much for him. Got to do a tag team run with him in PCW and learn so much. We had so much fun together, and that was it for him after that too. Yeah. He was he was done. He hasn't been back. I hope he does come back. I think he still has the the drive and passion to do at least one more little run. But um, switching, would, yeah, go ahead. I would love to have one more match with him, just one. You know, I mean, I even called him out on Facebook a while ago, and it might have been even been. A year or two ago but i was like all i'm asking for is one more match dude please one more match but you know if it happens it happens if it doesn't it doesn't so i saw that man no no same here um so yeah man so transitioning i mean you were training at the apw boot camp you were working with guys like sparky working with guys uh you know, like you said jekyll's the jester was your trainer who were some of the other guys in those first uh that first little bit that first year or two of training that was really helping you or you were really uh working with a lot and learning from well it's not fair to say, you know, just one group of people because ABW as a whole and just all of NorCal helped me grow as a wrestler. But, you know, the people who really had a hand in my training were, of course, Jekyll's the Jester, Brown Bomber, Robert Thompson, J.J. Perez, you know, and Justin Curley, Derek Sanders. Mm -hmm. And those were, you know, the core guys I really learned from, you know, and of course, Rick Luxury and MPT, you know, because whenever I was with APW, I would learn from APW. But on the weekends, I would go to Rick's backyard <laughs> and he would stretch me out and smarten me up a little bit. And 
you know, that actually advanced me a lot farther than I would have been, you know, if not for Rick. So You brought it up, Jody. Rick Luxury and his famous backyard uh, wrestling endeavors that were happening over there in Antioch, California, man. Um, as you know, I mean, the True TV incident was out there. It's national television. That's out there. You weren't really a part of that. But you had experienced some of the stuff there at Rick's house. I mean, uh, some call it beer brawl. Some just call it going to Rick's and having a good time. What were your, your more... Uh, I got to say this. I remember uh, there was a freestyle rap going on one night and Zach and Rick were having a uh, freestyle rap and you just rolled in uh, you know and then they just handed you the mic and you grabbed the mic bro and talking about spaghetti and all this stuff and everyone starts dying laughing I mean bro what were some of your other favorite memories there well, at Rick's house that that was one of my favorite memories yeah. and even though you know my party days are over but Beer Brawl 08 was actually with you in one right. of my first matches ever you know and it was a tag team match against Rig Luxury and DJ Riz. And they hit me with the sex change after that match. And it, you know, that was one of my favorite experiences because Riz, right after that match, said, you know, I don't know you well, but I already like you, you know, and you're just one of the guys I can tell who really loves this. And it really hit me hard when he died, you know, because he was always helpful to me and always wanted me to get better, you know, and... I'll praise that guy to the day I die. So but. yeah, no, no doubt, man. And you definitely carried us in that tag match uh, back then. No. It was, uh, it was a good time. And uh, moving on, I gotta tell this other story, man. Because again, we haven't sat down and talked in a while. Just kind of reflecting here. I remember uh, PCW had an event going on in Clear Lake. Uh, it was like 2009, and again, it's me and you, you know, loading up the ring. Oh. And it's at the old work farm, which is out in Loma Rica on the uh, on the Reeb property. And we're loading up the ring, Jody. And do you remember what happened, bro? We uh, we noticed that one of the goats in the, the farm, like a little actual real goat, yeah. is stuck in barbed wire. Can you uh, can you explain this to us, well, to everyone listening? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was this goat that you know. MPT, you know, he's a great wrestler, you know, and he brings guys to his work farm, you know, to help him train. But at the time, he was living, you know, with his dad, and his dad had goats. <laughs> and we're all training in the backyard, and all of a sudden we hear this, bah! you know, and there's this goat stuck in the wire, and we're like, oh, no, man, we got to get this thing out. And so I go over there, and I'm trying to get this thing out, and these kids walk up like, do you need help or anything? And it looks like I'm pushing this thing through the gate. <laughs> I'm like, it is not what it looks like, man. And I swear to God. And it's making all kinds of noises, too. It's like, Wah! the whole time. Wah! It's going nuts. Yeah, I don't know if people think I'm a weirdo or I'm an animal abuser or freaking, well, what's going on? But then finally we got the thing out, but it was just like... It, it was not a good day. It no, it's like not. it was like you were. I think what was happening is you were holding the goat. And we're trying to separate the skin from the barbed wire because yeah. it was caught, and it's going crazy, making loud goat noises. And I actually had to clip the yep. damn yep. thing. And oh man, what an experience, though, man! Always a great experience back in those days when we were hanging out and uh, doing and training and loading up rings and doing everything we used to do, man. And then I remember it was pretty much a short shortly after that. I believe you had your first match. Uh, it was against Vinny Massaro. Is yep. that right? Vinny Massaro, I don't remember exactly where it was, but we wrestled a inside a rodeo rink, you know, and the fans were sitting on bushels of hay, and it was for a kid, you know, who was trying to get money for a heart transplant. And my first match ever, my dad and my mom both came out for it, you know, my brother Chris Jr. came out for it too, and just the atmosphere of the place, you know, because we were all there for this kid, and just Vinny, who was, you know, my senior, and still is my senior, you know, just said, you know, don't worry, don't worry about shit, just go out there, let's do this, you know, and he beat the hell out of me in that match, and to the point where people thought, you know, okay, you like, forget winning him, Jody just survives this match, it's going to be great, but I ended up winning the match, and that was my first match ever, and it's still to this day one of my favorite matches. You know, I was still really green, still really young, but, you know, I'll never forget it. Well, Vinny Massaro's a guy that's been around. I mean, he's done a lot of things in the wrestling business. So what a great guy to yeah. be in there with for your first match. And I remember after that, man, kind of moving forward, you started uh, you started working a few different promotions. I remember you, you coming to PCW in 2010 and starting to – I believe you were like a, you were big country Jody Christopherson, red, white, and blue, yeah. and you were coming out here with your you did have your cowboy hat on and you were doing your thing, man. And um, 
what were some of your most memorable uh, you know, experiences uh, those first few years of being an um, active worker in the well, NorCal scene? Uh, like you said, you know, I rocked the cowboy hat a lot, but here at PCW, you know, I was part of the American Pride crew, right. American made Jody Christopherson, right. and that was one of my more memorable moments is when I wrestled Larry Blackwell, you know, and just when the crowd saw me, you know, it had to be like 200 people there, and oh, when... Least, yeah. When I got Larry over my head, you know, Larry's not a small dude. When I got this 400-pound man over my head for the torture rack and whole place does went nuts. I mean, my back is still messed up from that match. But, you know, Larry, again, you know, Larry was the veteran. Everybody I worked in, you know, in NorCal has helped me grow. And, you know, Larry beat the crap out of me. I beat the crap out of him, flew off the top rope, which uh, sometimes I don't do anymore. But... <laughs> It was just a ride, man. Back then, you know, it, I was just living the dream. Yeah, know? man. And you started really uh, taking pride in your body and started heck, lifting a lot of weights and packing some size on. So you were strong enough to pick up a 400-pound man. Um, and then also I noticed uh, a memorable thing I remember uh, it felt like for you and for everybody at PCW was when you defeated Dylan Drake and became the PCW Inter-California Champion in Chico. Um, what are your thoughts on that match? Well... That was my first singles championship that I've won. And I actually cried at the end of that match because it was just so moving to me, you know, and it was so humbling that Dylan, you know, was willing to pass the torch like that. And because I've always looked up to Dylan, you know, since day one, you know, all these guys like Adam Thornstow, Rick Luxury, MBT, those are the guys who are the workhorses you want to learn from. And, but at the time, Dylan and Jekylls were considered kind of like the young guys, you know, and their job was to look after us, who <laughs> we were just the students. And just to be able to work with Dylan and do what we do in there, you know, just watching him do his thing. And that's a guy who did a 180 on his whole persona, too. You know, he used to come out, you know, just the 90210, you know, baby face. Yeah, you know, and now he's the golden boy. Right. And... I'd be surprised if that guy didn't make a million dollars in this business. Definitely. You know? No, yeah. definitely, bro. And guys like Dylan and Adam and Zach and Rick and all these guys, the veterans of NorCal, of course they want to uh, work with you, Jody, and, and give you everything they have because you're one of these guys that's just so humble and so nice and everybody just really just loves as soon as they get to know you. Well, I, I've been told time and time again I'm too nice to be a wrestler, but, you know, Thanks to the WWE, I'm a little bit more of an asshole. So you know, well, you there's a fighting be. chance for me. But yeah, you have to be, man. Because if you're if you're too nice, I mean, people will take advantage of that. So I mean, mm -hmm. I'm glad that um, yeah, I want to transition into your into your WWE uh, you know contract. Uh, I guess it was FCW at the time. Um, but I remember your last little um, hurrah here in NorCal before that happened was uh, currently as we record this, you're the APW Universal Heavyweight Champion. And I remember though, before you left, you actually, I believe you, did you defeat Larry Blackwell and become the APW Champion then? Um, no, it was Jekylls. Sorry. I beat yes. Je yeah, Jekylls in the Carnival of Shadows. Uh, we, I had just done a match and they all came to the ring and started beating the crap out of me and Jekyll said you know why wait for the title match you know let's do this right now and you know everyone was on their seat like holy shit is Jody gonna win this is Jody gonna win this because everybody in the crowd you know knew me they knew me since I started training they wanted me to win that title and I won it and the place went nuts, and then I just went, you know, it breaks my heart, but I can't keep this title because I was signed to the WWE, and roof just blew off the place. And that was my favorite moment because I just turned around and saw Roland, and he's got tears streaming down his face, and I've never gotten that reaction from Roland before, you know, because... I mean, I know Roland loved me, but at the same time, you know, he was frustrated with me a lot because I was a dumb kid, you know, and I we butted heads a lot you know when it came to training but just with him saying you know my patience with you is paid off you know you really have come you know full circle as a worker and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do you know in the WWE and fortunately that didn't turn out but you know I was told by one of my coaches Norman Smiley don't count out coming back here because people get hired and fired all the time 
So. Well, you took the words out of my mouth, man, coming full circle. Because, like, you started training with APW, and Jekylls is your trainer. And then here you are a couple years later. Jekylls is the champion of APW, your home company, and you defeat him for that championship. You got Roland Alexander in tears, so happy for you and so proud of you. And I want to touch on Alexander a little bit if we can, because I believe you guys were roommates. And, um, I mean, what are some of your uh, most fondest memories of Roland Alexander and living and you know being under his tutelage oh man just I did nothing but learn from Roland when it came to wrestling but being his roommate was physical comedy <laughs> because the guy had a short temper you know and I know he was living with his girlfriend at the time Janice and they would always be shouting at each other you know and yelling at each other but I mean they loved each other but you know couples fight that's what they do and just Sitting there and being a fly on the wall listening to these fights was probably the favorite moment of my day after training. <laughs> and people were like, how do you live in that house, dude? How do you not go nuts? I was like, are you kidding? I'm laughing every day, dude. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> it was like a sitcom or something. I mean, just Roland did not care how big or how bad you were. He would always, you know, act like he was 500 pounds and seven feet tall. And he wasn't. <laughs> But he acted like it. Definitely. Always yeah. would speak his mind and always tell you exactly what he thought and no, and would never pull punches. And nothing but respect for Roland. I, over the years, uh, myself and Roland have had our uh, differences. And I'm so thankful, man. I'm so thankful we were able to, uh, um, you know, uh, mend those um, before he left us, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm so thankful because I felt so bad. And it was it was great. I learned from Roland, too. Those That last little uh, time he was here with us, it was great to learn from Roland because he is just, he's the godfather. He's the godfather, yeah. So, all right, Jody. So then transitioning here, man, 2000, uh, 2012, I believe it was, early 2012, late 2011, you're, shit, you're, you're moving to Florida and you're, you, WWE called you up. And, I mean, uh, How'd that go, man? What was that experience like? Well, obviously, it was exciting. It was nerve-wracking. You know, I walked in there, and Dr. Tom, you know, didn't even think that I was signed. He was like, are you doing a tryout? And I said, uh, <laughs> no, I'm actually signed to start training here. And he was like, oh, shit, yeah, you're Jody, right? You know, and I love Dr. Tom, man. He was freaking hilarious, you know, I mean... I know I've already cussed up a storm already, but, you know, I'm going to do an, a little for this story because, like, before he got let go, Tom looked out for all the boys, you know, and he just told it like it was. I mean, maybe that's why he got let go because he was really passionate about what he did, you know. And there's one time, one of the guys, Andy Hackman from Tough Enough, you know, uh, hit, well, he didn't start it. I mean, there's this kid, Sonny Elliott, who is Australian, who walks into the ice machine room after... Doc put up three signs that say, stay out of the ice machine room. You know, it's broken. So this guy starts putting on his tanning oil in the ice machine room. Uh -oh. And Dr. Tom says, everybody, we're having a meeting right now, you know. And so he berates us for half an hour, you know, going, I put three signs up that say, stay the fuck out. I guess in Australia it means come the fuck in. <laughs> Oi, mate, this looks like a good place to put on me tanning oil. No, no, it's not a good place to put on your fucking tanning oil. And after a half an hour... They berate us with this saying, guys, if there's three signs that stay up that say, stay out of the ice machine room, stay out of the ice machine room. Here walks in Andy Hackman looking for his boots. He goes into the ice oh, machine no. room. And Joey Mercury's just looking at him and going, Hackman, what the hell, man? And we all start laughing. It was just, you know, this all those guys. You know, Rusev was my brother there growing up. So was Martin Stone, a.k.a. Danny Birch. And those were like my two brothers you know, to this day. And actually when, you know, um, when I was on my way out of there, I became really good friends with Sammy Callahan and Jessica Havoc, and I still live with them in Orlando now, you know, and I've done nothing but learn from Sammy too. And that's the thing is even though you get let go, there's still so many people out there in Florida, so many people here in California that you can still learn from. And if anybody who's listening to this who's been let go or thinks they don't have what it takes anymore, WWE isn't the end-all be-all. You can still make a living as a professional wrestler. Go to Europe. Go to Japan. You know, if you really love this, you're not going to stop. Definitely, man. And and going back there, you started early 2012. This was before the Performance Center, I believe, right? So yeah. where were you guys training out of? We were training at FCW at Steve Kern's building. And, you know, some of our 
favorite days were when Dusty Rhodes and Dr. Tom, you know, because they had heat with each other, and they, you know, Doc would be walking down the steps of the building, and Dusty would just be like, oh, baby, you know, look who it is. And, oh, shut the fuck up, Dusty. We'd all start losing it, because, you know, Dusty, he'd be like, baby, Doc, how come you're the head coach? You couldn't work back then. You can't work now. <laughs> so they got into each other a couple times, but, you know, I mean, and Dusty, you know, we we're talking about Roland being the godfather of APW. Dusty was the godfather of NXT. You know, he called us his kids. He And when I got let go, he called me and said, wake up, you know. And I was like, Dusty? He was like, baby, how come you don't call me no more? I was like, well, you're busy. He was like, well, what the fuck am I busy with? <laughs> and I said, well, you got all the other guys at the PC. He was like, baby, fuck them. I want to talk to you. And right when he said that, I was like, I love you, Dusty, because... He was always on my side, you know, even, you know, when the suits and the people were like, oh, you know, Garrett's not anything special or Jody's not anything special. You know, he was always on my side. And he even said, you know, in front of everybody, it's a sad day when Jody Christopherson gets let go. But when my friend Troy McClain got let go, this guy who looked like a superstar, he was trained by Knox Pro, too. You know, he had the look, he had the charisma, you know, he could talk on the mic, but he had a hard time in the ring. And when Dusty... <laughs> hears that he gets let go he looks right at the camera and starts yelling you guys don't know what the hell we're doing down here do you and like dusty calm down he's like no you fired a movie star so what if he can't wrestle half the guys on tv can't wrestle you fired a movie star uh yeah just i could go all day with dusty sorry but he's you know he was one of my more positive role models there so. yeah no i love it jody i love it. how long were you under developmental contract there I, a little over two years, almost three, you know. I mean, I got let go and then rehired because uh, they said they made a mistake. But, you know, it is what it is. And I teamed a little bit with Scott Dawson, who I did nothing but learn from as well, you know. And I might get a lot of heat for this, but I'm going to say it. That guy is the best worker on the roster, you know. I mean, just they actually pulled him in the office and said, Stop doing what you're doing in the ring. You're making guys who dwarf you in the ring look bad. He's like, so what you're telling me to do is be not be a good wrestler. What the hell, guys? You know, but yeah. so you I, saw the, I wish that guy nothing but the best. Yeah, know? yeah, he's doing big things now, Dash and Dawson. I think they're the NXT Tag Team Champions. And, I mean, you saw the transition then from the FCW into the NXT and the, the Performance Center. Is that correct? And and how was that, man? What was the, I mean, drastic Sorry, change. Could you repeat that? So you were you got signed two thousand early two thousand twelve, late two thousand eleven. Yeah. You started in FCW, like you said, under Dr. Tom Pritchard, and then of course Dusty Rhodes. But then I believe in two thousand twelve was the uh, the or two thousand thirteen maybe yeah. the WWE Performance Center. And how was that transitioning, man? What was that like? I gotta tell you, it was like it was just my breath was taken away because FCW was kind of like, you know, a dojo, you know, kind of like APW, PCW. Right. And so when Triple H says we're moving to Orlando and they put us in this facility that's like an NFL facility, there's like seven rings, one of them that's just for top rope moves, you know, it's like a huge crash pad ring. And they got, you know, their weights and their personal trainers, you know, so you lift and then you train or depending on what class you're in, you train and then you lift. And then they got an upstairs kitchen, you know, with a TV so you can watch footage when you're not working. And they got a little promo room where you can cut promos in. And they're just on their A game out there, you know. I mean, they they want to train people to succeed, you know. And it can be emotionally taxing, but they know what they're doing over there. So. Yeah. From what I've seen, bro, it looks absolutely incredible. And from what I've heard, I mean, it sounds like it's the ultimate pro wrestling experience. Um, so, Jody, you, you said you got released, man. They brought you back. I mean, how long was that? Like they, they let you go, and they, then how long before they called you back and said, oh, we definitely made a mistake. You're, we want you back. Well, you know, they it was about six months, okay. you know, and that's why Norman Smiley told me don't count out not coming back here. And even Joey Mercury told me he's been fired like four or five times. <laughs> right. But they always take him back, and that gave me hope, you know, because – even if I never get back to the WWE, like I said, if I go to Japan or Europe, make a living, I'll be all right. But if they call me again, of course, I'll go back, you know, because everybody wants to be there, you know. But it is what it is. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I'm okay with that, you know. When, so, did, they, but, when did they call you back? Oh, they called me back, like I said, about six months or after I got let go. 
So it was like half a year. So like 2014? Yeah, 2014. And then how long did you stay that time? Then I stayed for, you know, another half a year, you know, so, and so I was probably there all together for almost three years, like I said. So, gotcha. And um, who were some of the guys? You know, obviously Dusty Rhodes, like you said, man, just a guy that really liked you and you really learned a lot from. Who were some of the other talents there that you worked with and you learned a lot from and you had a great time with? Well, Nick Desmore was awesome. You know, he was actually one of my favorite coaches because, you know, I love entertaining people and he was all about entertainment. And he was the one who helped me out a lot with Captain Comic, you know, and that's another joke character, you know, that I've been doing. And, you know, this listening to him talk and hearing about his experience growing up, you know, was great. And Norman Smiley was a great coach. Robbie Brookside was a great coach. You know, I mean, Norman is pro I'm not taking anything away from any other coach there, but Norman is the best technical coach you're ever going to see because just this guy, like I used to give him crap all the time because he's like, I'm a broken down old man. I can't work no more. I said, bull crap. You tie us in the knots every day. You got one more match in you. <laughs> and when I said that, Joey Mercury looks at me and says, one more match? That guy's got one more run. <laughs> and we all just started losing it. But, you know, I learned a lot from Norman. And, you know, A-Train, you know, Tensai, he, he was great too, you know. And... He just kept it real, you know, hey, don't go to the outside of the ring, guys. You go outside of the ring, I get yelled at by Triple H, so knock it off. <laughs> you know, but yeah. So the difference between me and Bill is Bill will talk to you like you're five years old. I won't do that. I'll just fight you. <laughs> Might not win, but I'll do it. I'll fight anybody here. But. And I got to ask, man, because it's been a lot of talk over the, the years about Bill DeMont and his training. I mean, how, how was that for you? You know, I've been getting a lot. Of questions about this and a lot of mixed feelings from everybody because you know everyone had their own personal experience with Bill and I'm gonna tell you what I tell everybody else you know Bill was a rough trainer but he was getting paid to be a rough trainer he was being the kind of trainer Triple H wanted him to be he wanted to wean out the people who didn't really want to be there and yes we butted heads a lot you know but he was good at what he did and he made me a better wrestler and you know, if I saw him on the street, I'd probably buy him lunch. <laughs> yeah. You know? For sure, man. I hear that. I mean, I, I, that's kind of how Zach was with me, man. He was a tough trainer. And Zach's trainer, you know, Schizo, yep. oh, was Jesus. a tough damn man. trainer. So it's like, I, I don't know. The stories. <laughs> I don't know what guys expect nowadays. They want you if they want you to just hold your hand and walk you through everything. It's just not going to go down like that. Pro wrestling is a tough damn sport. It's one of the hardest things on your body, as you know, bro. It's just you got to be tough. Physically and mentally. Yeah, well, that's what kind of irritates me now is that I come back and I see that there's people who want to get paid for setting up the ring. You know, <laughs> they they want to, you know this from being one of the only guys who helped me set up the ring. Like, we were the ring crew, you yeah. know, just the two of us. And just setting up all those rings, you know, doing all those miles on the road, you know, having eight guys in a four-person car and sleeping on the floors of crackhead motels. It's like... <laughs> That's wrestling, you know, that's, you got to pay your dues, you know, and a lot of people forget that. And that's why we're always told when we get into this, do you love wrestling? Because if you don't really love it, it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand in this day and age that that's just how this business works, you know. And yeah. I honestly can say I don't regret anything that's happened to me because no. that made me who I am. Goddamn war pig. That's right, man. And you never stop paying your dues, and you're a guy that's proof of that, man. Here you are. She showed up early today. You're doing this interview with me, man. You don't have to do that. You're a guy that's been on television and done a lot of stuff in the wrestling business, so. I'm not a superstar. <laughs> Come on. I mean, like, but thank you. Well, we thank could, you. yeah, no doubt, Jody. And, and then, you know, you, you, you left, you, you know, unfortunately, they let you go, mm -hmm. and uh, which I think is a mistake. And there's probably a chance you will go back or... You know, who, who knows what's going to happen, but you're back here, you're, you're living in Florida, I know you're doing a lot of stuff out there, you're back here in NorCal wrestling, uh, you're the APW Universal Heavyweight Champion, um, what does the future hold for the War Pig? Well, I'd be lying if I said I knew, you know, I mean, right now all I'm focusing on is keeping my titles, you know, I mean, I'm also a champion in Bushido Pro Wrestling, but I'm not, you know, the undisputed champion i still gotta beat adam thornstow for that and you know that's a match i'm looking forward to but right now i'm just focusing on keeping my titles and 
working as much places as I can, and I can't stress that more than, uh, than enough, is that if you want to grow as a worker, if you want to grow as a professional wrestler, you have to work everywhere. That's why I get pissed off when I see schools who isolate their students and don't let them work and don't let them breathe. Because if you don't expand, you're not going to grow. And that's just the bottom line. That's great advice, Jody. Uh, where can people find more out about Jody Christofferson on uh, social media? Well, you can look me up on Twitter at Jody Warpig. And also, you know, on Facebook, this is Jody Christofferson. You know, and I'm a simple guy. I like to keep my social information simple. So <laughs> it is what it is. But, yeah, just find me on Facebook. Find me on Twitter. You're a simple guy, Jody. You're an awesome guy. Thank you very much for coming on the show, bro. It's great to see you. Great to talk to you, as always. Oh, hey, oh, it's a pleasure, man. I love you. So take it easy. One of my favorite people in the world right there, Jody Christofferson. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. And make sure you guys follow Jody Christofferson, everything he's doing. I know he's currently the APW Universal Heavyweight Champion, doing big things for all pro wrestling, doing big things for any promotion that he works for. And uh, speaking of a great promotion and a great production company, Superstar Productions, uh, Mike Shoup created the graphic that you see right there in front of you for episode 14 of Mitch Please. They can create any graphic, any design that you have in mind um, and edit any video and put together commercials and uh, you know highlight videos and you know resume videos and just anything you can think of uh superstar productions can do it they can also take pictures of you of them doing it you know they're great they got photography uh experience uh hit them up on facebook superstar productions make sure you also Check out uh, Got Mitch Marketing on Facebook. If you need help promoting or advertising an event, Got Mitch Marketing can do it all. You know, in conjunction with Superstar Productions as well. So you put them both on your team, and you can do you can conquer the world. Uh, it's been going on for for a decade in pro championship wrestling, if I could say so. So, uh, you know, check that out, guys. Of course, Mitch, please this show, like it on Facebook, share it, invite your friends. You know, we're again, we're gonna be only doing it once a month now. We're gonna make it special. You know, it's gonna be a once a month. Uh, you know, one hour, hopefully, maybe sometimes it'll go a little more. I know this one's going a little longer. So, you know, that's just how I'm going to do it this, this time, you know, right now I'll update you guys what's going on with me personally. And, uh, you know, the road to recovery and I will also have some superstar guests. So I might have one, I might have two. You just have to stay tuned, you know, stay uh, subscribed to youtube.com slash the Mitch Valentine and uh, send it, any and all feedback to my Twitter at Heartbreaker MV. All right, guys, we're going to do something different this week in honor of uh, CM Punk, in, in honor of his first fight this Saturday, UFC 203. I'm going to end you with an inspirational quote from CM Punk and it goes like this no my reputation doesn't bother me it's just what it is that is my role here I am who I am I do not apologize for it if I'm in a bad mood I wear it on my sleeve it's not like I run around treating people poorly and smack coffee out of hands or pissing people's Cheerios or anything like that if I'm in a bad mood I'm in a bad mood that's the way it is. I'm not overly malicious about it. It doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother the people who truly know me either. They accept me for who I am. The people who are misinformed can screw. I really couldn't care less what people think of me.